So, uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, to our uh, all our visitors, our distinguished panelists. Uh, happy to greet you. Uh, unfortunately, not in Isola. My wife is from Isola. I have to say, <laughs> and I would really wish to be there, uh, but uh, uh, pandemic uh, didn't allow us. So today's uh, panel will be not only about pandemic and recovery, but primarily about smart grids and hydrogen. These are two topics which somehow obsessed the uh, European continent, and I, I would say not only European one, uh, because uh, they are so fast developing. Uh, when preparing for this, I, I went um, uh, to see what the International Energy Agency says about smart grids. I will read definition once again because uh, it's good to refresh the memory. So it's an energy network that uses digital and other advanced technologies to monitor and manage the transport of energy from all generation sources to meet the varying energy demands of end users. Sounds very logic, but uh, 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 in practice, it is uh, quite challenging uh, because uh, we need to maximize system re reliability, resilience, stability, minimize costs, environmental impacts, uh, and uh, all this by constant adaptation of these energy flows. Uh, and all this is somehow covered by a smart word, smart grids. Uh, for this, a proper telecommunication equipment is crucial uh, and uh, also organization of uh, uh, energy system as such. Uh, uh, USR, especially eastern part of USR, is lagging behind European Union in the context of digital and energy transformation. And uh, 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 we have challenges like higher level of intermittent renewables, integration of storages, phase out of uh, uh, fossil fuel generation units, which is of course uh, less base, base load electricity. We have demand side management, customer engagement, prosumers. All this is happening uh, uh, at once in a, uh, in, on a big scale and uh, uh, all this, uh, of course, uh, imposes vast increase of collection, flows, exchanges of di digital data, uh, which are necessary to run the whole system functioning or efficiently. Uh, the energy sector is becoming one big and highly complex cyber physical system. Uh, uh, and uh, it's hard to cope with all this. Uh, and on top of that, uh, we have decarbonization, where, thanks God, we have hydrogen. Hydrogen nicely fits into uh, all this complexity uh, because uh, it seems it, it can offer a panacea, uh, a magical solution to the grid flexibility. Uh, we, we cannot have enough pump storage, uh, demand side measures, batteries, elect electric vehicles, and so on. Uh, it's, all this is not enough to ensure security of supply and avoid renewables curtailment uh, under certain conditions. Uh, and uh, we need a gas which has enough calories. This seems hydrogen, but hydrogen, of course, which should be produced only out of renewables through electrolyzers. Uh, electrolyzers can increase the flexibility of the grid and can step in as extra consumption very quickly. And on the other side, produced hydrogen can be used as energy storage and can be burned in turbines to produce electricity when needed. Uh, but there are serious challenges uh, as well. They are not only technological and financial, but also on the policy side and legal, uh, Taxational, I would say. So, taxation of energy storages, yes or not, access to network, how to regulate a hydrogen market, if to regulate it at all, uh, gas quality uh, standards, and so on and so on. The whole new world is opening uh, in front of us. 
uh, also geopolitics is uh, at a stake. Uh, once we were dependent on, let's say, Middle East to import uh, oil, uh, now perhaps in the future we will be dependent on, on some other countries to import hydrogen. And um, in the EUSR area, nice initiatives are developing. Hydrogen potential is big in Albania, it's big in Croatia, uh, and in some other countries as well. So all these are really serious challenges which will shape our next years and decades of energy politics. And about all this, uh, you will hear more today from our distinguished speakers. Uh, we have two uh, introductory, let's say, keynote uh, uh, speakers, uh, and the first one is uh, Cosma Panzaki, uh, uh, Italian, uh, uh, Romanian from Rome, <laughs> born in 1978, and uh, he's, uh, uh, he's heading the business unit Hydrogen in SNAM. SNAM is, everybody knows, second largest European regulated utility and one of the top five industrial companies in Italy by market capitalization. Uh, Cosma was previously executive vice president of digital transformation and technology also in SNAM. His uh, career in SNAM is uh, uh, extraordinary. He was chief of staff for SNAM, CEO, and led the so-called Lean program. Uh, and uh, in general, he has uh, extensive experiences and cross industry uh, in cross industry and multinational issues. And of course, a distinguished um, uh, academic career, MBA from Stanford Graduate School of Business and uh, Master of Science in Economics from University of Pisa. Uh, Cosma, the screen, I cannot say the floor, but the screen is yours. <laughs> Uh, please. Well, thank you very much for uh, the introduction and also thank you very much also for the, the opportunity today to uh, speak to such a distinguished audience. Uh, um, I think that today is a, a great opportunity for us as SNAM to, uh, uh, you know, uh, refresh a number of connections that we uh, traditionally had in the gas business uh, regarding the hydrogen business, because we think that there is a, a, a huge opportunity here uh, in the bridge between uh, the, uh, the region of the Balkans uh, and uh, a number of, uh, you know, also consumption areas in the rest of Europe. So what I will do in my presentation today is really very briefly to go over what SNAM is doing in this area. And then I will leave uh, uh, at the end with some questions for, for the audience, because I think uh, what we want to get out of, of this meeting is uh, uh, the start of a dialogue on concrete opportunities in, in the hydrogen space in the region. So if you can broadcast uh, the, the charts, um, I... Um, or I can share those. It's fine for me. Uh, mm. Organizers, can, can you? I can, I can share those. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm, I'm totally fine. I only understood the opposite before. Okay. Can you see the screen? Can, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see. Okay, great. So basically, uh, as I said, uh, I wanted to start with, uh, you know, an overview of what SNAM is, uh, sorry about that, what SNAM is doing in the hydrogen space. And uh, there we are. Okay. And basically, uh, from, from, oops, from this point of view, uh, let me... I'm sorry because the, the display is not full screen. So it's uh, just one second here. Okay. Okay. Let's do in a different way. My bad. Okay. Voila. 
There we are. Okay, now it should be working properly. There we are. And here it is, finally. Okay. So what SNAM is doing in a space? Uh, basically, SNAM, uh, as you know, and uh, uh, as we, we introduced before, uh, is an Italian company uh, operating in the energy infrastructure business. Uh, we uh, are basically the largest uh, uh, energy infrastructure player in continental Europe. Uh, and we have recently expanded across a number of geographies, including Greece and including the uh, United Emirates. Uh, pretty recently with our participation in the Galaxy project. What is most important here, I think, to stress is that we are uh, we have launched in the last couple of years a number of what we call startups, all related to the energy transition space. Uh, and I think this is relevant also for today's discussion because there are clear synergies between, uh, for example, biomethane, which is uh, today covered by the so-called SNAM for Environment, uh, mobility, uh, covered, of course, by SNAM for mobility, and uh, uh, hydrogen and efficiency and energy efficiency. Uh, all these elements together can create a value chain where hydrogen is part of the energy transition equation. And uh, if we look at the Balkans, there are a number of items here that we think are uh, can be replicated in different countries in the region. And uh, we can be also more explicit, perhaps, uh, uh, going on a, a country by country uh, discussion. Uh, what uh, is NAM doing internationally? Uh, as you know, we have first expanded in Europe and then uh, uh, outside Europe. And again, the reason why we are showing this chart is not just to remind the perimeter of SNAM, but once again, to give you a flavor of uh, the role that we also want to play in the hydrogen space. We believe the hydrogen will be clearly an international market uh, where we will have uh, flows of hydrogen from some regions in Europe to other regions in Europe that will be mostly of takers of hydrogen, namely uh, heavily industrialized uh, uh, regions at the beginning, especially in uh, central and northern uh, and northern Europe. And we also believe that there will be a huge opportunity here for intercontinental trade of hydrogen, of low carbon hydrogen. We are already seeing uh, uh, areas in the world, uh, namely Australia and the Middle East, that are pushing for being uh, hydrogen exporting hubs, where hydrogen could cost as low as two euros per kilo. Uh, and these areas could therefore be in, play an important role in an intercontinental uh, network to supply uh, some uh, hubs of consumptions, such as the one that we will see in uh, Europe. Uh, I guess that all the audience is uh, familiar with uh, the so-called uh, uh, characterization of hydrogen in uh, uh, gray, blue, and green. But of course, there are also other so-called colors of hydrogen, which are based on the uh, carbon intensity of the production process of hydrogen itself. And also, uh, they are based on the availability of uh, uh, feedstock uh, in the process. So another area to have in mind, which we uh, rarely hear in discussions uh, at regulatory level, is of course the area of the so-called uh, uh, turquoise hydrogen, or the hydrogen, I should say, that comes from uh, uh, methane pyrolysis. That's also another very interesting areas, area, which we think uh, could be of interest, especially where uh, natural gas infrastructure is uh, developing uh, and natural gas uses are uh, important. Uh, what is hydrogen going to be used for? In our view and according to our uh, estimates, uh, hydrogen will initially be used in three types uh, of different applications. Application number one, uh, hydrogen in industrial uses uh, as a substitute of uh, uh, gray hydrogen. So uh, uh, the traditional hydrogen that is produced through uh, steam methane reforming, for example, that will be substituted by uh, with low carbon hydrogen. 
this is something that we are seeing, for example, in the refining sector where we are working in Italy, but there are other players, for example, BP uh, working intensively and also Shell working intensively on their uh, refineries in Northern Europe. Uh, and of course, there's the entire segment of uh, hard to abate uh, industrial clients, especially in the pet chem and fertilizers area, where this will become uh, immediately relevant. Then looking a little bit with a wider eye on the in, that, in the industrial space, hydrogen will also be a, a crucial uh, tool uh, through which um, other are to abate uh, industrial segments will be decarbonized. And from that point of view, hydrogen will not, low carbon hydrogen will not displace existing hydrogen consumption, but it will displace methane. Uh, so from this point of view, and again, looking at similarities between uh, what happens in Italy and what uh, could happen in the Balkans, uh, one of the most interesting sector here is represented, for example, by uh, the area of uh, uh, steel making and glass making production. The second area where we see uh, a huge potential for hydrogen is mobility. Of course, not light vehicles mobility, but uh, heavy mobility uh, on the train in the train segment, first of all, and also uh, in the freight truck transportation. Uh, there are a number of OEMs that will come out with their products in the, uh, during the next 24 months. Uh, namely, among these, uh, Iveco, but also most importantly, Volvo and Daimler together. Uh, and we are already um, perceiving an increasing level of, of demand by freighters uh, of this type of uh, transportation. Uh, the reason is very simple. Uh, if you do the math, uh, hydrogen freight uh, trucks are actually competitive uh, or will actually be competitive already next year with uh, existing alternatives, uh, traditional alternatives. So um, to be indifferent basically between diesel and hydrogen, uh, you need to have hydrogen at the pump at around eight euros per kilo, which is something that is, uh, um, I'm not saying easy, easy to reach, but it can be reached already now. Then there's the third area, which is uh, hydrogen for commercial uses. Here we see hydrogen as a natural complement to renewables, and in particular, fuel cells that are hydrogen ready uh, can be uh, already now competitive for cogeneration uses. Uh, I kept outside the uh, more general theme of uh, sector coupling and REST integration because there, hydrogen can be the natural, uh, if you want, bridge between renewables, increasing renewable penetration and decarbonization, especially where there are bottlenecks uh, in uh, electricity grid. So what is NAM doing in this space? And how can NAM help also uh, companies and also institutions in the Balkans to think about this? We are working on three different areas. Uh, area number one, we are working on the technological upgrade of our own infrastructure, uh, verifying that from a metallurgic point of view, pipelines are ready to transport hydrogen. And according to our estimates, uh, approximately 70% of our networks are already 100% hydrogen ready. We are also uh, working on membranes to uh, allow for the blending and then the separation of hydrogen and methane, which uh, uh, allows to use, if you want, an existing infrastructure in a dual mode uh, solution. Then we're working on the system design. This is very important because no one at European level has already cracked, if you want, the uh, perfect regulatory and incentive system for uh, the hydrogen economy to be developed. And this is something that we're working at European level, global level, and Italian level. So very happy to share our experience here. And then there's the area of value chain development. Value chain development is connected with exactly the type of applications that I was talking about uh, before. And that I think would be extremely relevant also uh, in the Balkans because uh, in a hydrogen economy, what we are seeing is also a set of opportunities for traditional companies to reinvent themselves as suppliers in this area. For example, on metering, for example, on valves, for example, on the uh, final appliances using hydrogen, for example, in the uh, mobility space. 
to focus a little bit more on the uh, infrastructure space. So the first pillar that I described, and then uh, I will speed up to the final applications to then leave uh, the floor to uh, my fellow speakers. Uh, what we have been doing there is, as I said, testing the pipelines, but also testing all the rest of the ecosystem, which is something that we are doing progressively in terms of uh, compressing stations and underground storage, uh, and I should say also above ground storage. Uh, and this is something that we are ready to share with uh, uh, institutions, countries and players that would be interested in this, as we also lead um, a coalition of 11 European TSOs that are working exactly on these technical aspects. And it is with those TSOs that we started to um, identify what can be, let me say, the hydrogen highway going forward for the moment at Western European level. And we would be extremely interested to uh, enrich this picture, which we call the hi European hydrogen backbone with a, a wider scope, including also uh, the eastern part of our continent. There's an immense potential, as we said, to create trade flows here and also to improve uh, the business case for existing infrastructure or infrastructure that could be built uh, in order to satisfy hydrogen demand. Um, there's a space here, we believe, uh, for huge investments also because to transport one kilo of hydrogen for 1000 kilometers through a pipeline, uh, we estimate the cost to be between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 euro per kilo, which is less than 5% uh, than the cost of hydrogen in the most uh, efficient and the most competitive scenarios. Uh, this brings us to uh, another crucial point, uh, which is, however, the following. In order to make sure that the hydrogen ecosystem uh, uh, develops and thrives, uh, we need to create alliances. What we are showing here is what we have done only in one uh, geography. So what we have done uh, in Italy. But this type of, uh, uh, of work needs to be replicated everywhere in all the regions of Europe. Uh, hydrogen is a, um, such a complex uh, uh, space that it needs uh, electricity players, uh, sorry, it needs electricity players, technology players, gas players, uh, and also final takers to work together to devise uh, effective business plans. And that's where local institutions typically play a crucial role in the matchmaking effort. Uh, of course, one key element is also bringing the right technology to the table. And one thing that clearly the Balkans could be at the center of, given their uh, history and tradition of uh, scientific prowess on the technological side, uh, is working, for example, on part of the uh, hydrogen production ecosystem. Uh, there is an opportunity here to become suppliers, to create innovation, to uh, attract uh, European funding. Also because we need this sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, technological news really to drive the cost of green hydrogen down. This is a chart that we typically show and that uh, shows basically that by 2027, 2028, uh, uh, green hydrogen from uh, um, competitive renewable areas can actually uh, be competitive against the traditional gray hydrogen. But the most important part about this chart, we believe, is the fact that the, the slope of the green hydrogen cost curve can be much steeper if we are able to uh, step up uh, not only the uh, incremental R&D uh, work on green hydrogen, but also the creation of gigafactories uh, on the, in the electrolyzer space. And once again, uh, the fact that the Balkans have turned in, uh, uh, progressively over the years uh, in a manufacturing powerhouse in a number of crucial uh, manufacturing sectors, such as automotive, uh, uh, can be the perfect leeway to actually create other opportunities there and to be at the center of the green hydrogen revolution. I will leave with the final uh, chart here, uh, which points out our 
uh, you know, uh, estimates, high-level estimates of uh, when hydrogen will become competitive in a number of different sectors, uh, which somewhat gives also a roadmap, I think, in terms of uh, uh, what applications could be relevant in the Balkans, but also what applications could be relevant for hydrogen production located in the Balkans and then added also to uh, export towards other European countries. There is a huge potential here, we think on, as we said before, on mobility, but also on uh, uh, some specific industrial applications. And we believe that the Balkans can play two roles here. Role number one, as a test bed, as the rest of Europe for industrial applications per se. Role number two, given also the growth of renewables in, uh, in the region and also the uh, interconnections that do exist between the Balkans and the rest of Europe as a uh, center of green hydrogen production and export towards the rest of European markets. So I'll stop here. I thank you for your attention. And of course, I'm open to any sort of questions and doubts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Panzaki. Uh, that was inspiring and uh, refreshing and optimistic uh, and uh, uh, about the potential of the region uh, in, in, in this future uh, energy developments, uh, which will reshape our everyday life uh, in next decades. Our, uh, I will jump now to the, because uh, we really have to stick to the timetable. Uh, organizers told me that at 1.30 they will start uh, um, with the award uh, celebration. Uh, and uh, we, have, we cannot uh, prolong even for one minute. Uh, so we really have to stick to the timetable. Next speaker is uh, Konstantinos Papalukas uh, with us. Uh, and uh, uh, he is, uh, um, I, I don't know what he isn't, <laughs> I'm reading here, energy policy expert, uh, Eastern Mediterranean specialist. Uh, he's advising uh, Greek uh, Minister of Environment and Energy on energy policy, infrastructure and energy investments. Uh, from December 2020, appointed as the coordinator of the National Hydrogen Committee whose mandate is to prepare the hydrogen strategy uh, of the Hellenic Republic. Associated at Harvard University's Belfer Center, uh, he, was, he has an experience, uh, he was employed by U.S. House uh, Energy and Commerce uh, Committee. Uh, he founded EastMed Energy uh, Hub, uh, working uh, for the University of Cyprus as well. Um, and uh, he's in, active in United Nations group of guest experts, UNETSE, a group of experts of CMM and the Task Force of Hydrogen, Master of Public Administration from Harvard, Kennedy School of Government, and so on and so on. Uh, Konstantinos, the screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Janic. Uh, an Eastern Roman, <laughs> you could say. Um, so, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Excellent. So, uh, distinguished guests, the ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you today and provide my remarks in this session of the sixth forum of the EU strategy for the Adriatic and the Ionian region, uh, they dedicated on how to connect our region, how to sparkle further cooperation through uh, the green energy recovery and resilience, and help our countries in Europe to emerge stronger from this pandemic. As a coordinator of the Greek National Hydrogen Committee, I will dedicate this speech on where else? Uh, hydrogen. Uh, a cross-cutting aspect as, as an emerging hydrogen economy can and will transversally affect all four thematic pillars of the EU's air. The connection of the region, the blue growth, the environmental quality, and even sustainable tourism to a lesser extent. In December 2020, our National Hydrogen Committee rolled up sleeves with the mandate to develop uh, the Greek National Hydrogen Strategy by the end of the first half of 2021. Uh, our National Hydrogen Strategy will entail a detailed roadmap for the emergence of a national hydrogen economy, 
aiming towards uh, a parallel development of the demand with that of building a sound backbone of the upstream, midstream, and downstream infrastructure. Uh, hydrogen is no longer an afterthought. And, and, and one of the main drivers of this admirable acceleration has been the special emphasis given from uh, a European level during the German and the Portuguese presidencies, setting a fast European pace and bringing hydrogen from a technology of uh, the 50s to a reality of the 30s. Uh, hydrogen is now gaining traction not only in Europe, but uh, in Asia as well, with many first moving countries like Japan and Korea uh, developing state-of-the-art technologies, but also it is incorporated as a hot topic in Biden's administration policy. Uh, hydrogen is a strategic priority for our energy transition as it is one of the leading options for storing energy, enabling the integration of variable renewables in the European energy mix, while also decarbonizing some hard to abate industries not so easy to electrify. Especially on green hydrogen, Greece uh, supports the EU goal of installing at least six, six gigawatt of renewable hydrogen electrolyzers in the EU by 2024 and 40 gigawatts of renewable hydrogen by 2030. And we will follow the proportionality principle. Uh, the parallel development of the supply with that of the demand it, it, with a holistic approach, uh, we hope that uh, it will set us free from the chicken and egg captivity issue. Uh, moreover, in December 2020, uh, Greece together uh, with Croatia, Italy and Slovenia and a group of another 18 member states plus Norway signed the manifesto for the development of a European hydrogen technologies and systems value chain to pursue ambitious low carbon and renewable hydrogen goals uh, uh, to build the sector of excellence in Europe. We recently launched the Greek expression of interest for the important projects of common European interest, the so-called IPCI or IPCI or as uh, an interministerial effort to secure national alignment in the development of our hydrogen economy. I'm very proud uh, that, that the Greek call has been embraced by our government vertically. Uh, this joint effort between the ministries of environment and energy, development and investments as uh, the originators and coordinators, and the ministries of shipping uh, and infrastructure and transportation along with the General Secretary of Research uh, and Innovation, um, laid down the grounds for attracting investments from the entire hydrogen value chain. Uh, these start from generation of green and blue hydrogen and expand all the way to create hydrogen ready ports and ferries, uh, launch uh, hydrogen bus fleets um, and other heavy duty vehicles, uh, convert heavy emitting industries to hydrogen powered ones, while also embrace uh, innovative Greek startups and spin-offs to continue innovate, innovating uh, at a global scale, uh, such as in the production of electrolyzers. Let me share with you that the process has just been completed and after a period of uh, three months of uh, hard and dedicated work, we can now count more than 20 uh, plus projects that have applied and wish to be included in this first wave of the hydrogen IPCI and they're currently under review and evaluation. Through this framework uh, that promotes interconnectivity and synergy development between uh, companies and institutions of at least three to four member states, we want to reach out to other companies from other member states and jointly uh, co-generate and share added value in IPCI projects through the upcoming matchmaking process. Uh, more precisely, uh, one of uh, our proposed projects uh, includes the production of green hydrogen in a former lignite side production through electrolysis and the ejection of this hydrogen inside the Trans-Adriatic pipeline, blending it with gas and delivering hydrogen uh, to Italy and then from there to Central Europe. Or uh, I can mention another one that will be producing blue hydrogen and we'll be shipping the captured carbon dioxide to a CO2 storage site located within the geography of our region. Uh, we ourselves view this as a strategic opportunity for Greece uh, to intensify our cooperation with the countries of our neighborhood, and especially the Adriatic and Ionian region, not only as a potential green, blue, uh, hydrogen upstreamers, but also as a gateway of hydrogen produced in the North Africa and Eastern Mediterranean. 
We are open to join new developer production sites and at the same time uh, provide investors the security to plan ahead and reduce market uncertainty. Uh, we are also eager to upgrade our interconnections gas-wise and electricity-wise. In the gas sector, uh, the European Hydrogen Backbone is, uh, Group, as Cosma mentioned before, uh, presented their vision of a nearly 40,000 kilometers of uh, hydrogen pipeline infrastructure covering 21 countries by 2040, uh, with 70% of the proposed hydrogen network being brownfield, repurposed, existing natural gas grids. In the Western Balkans, we are still on our way to expand our gas network and also make the decision if our companies should start building greenfield hydrogen pipelines or not. This should be taken into account and communicated thoroughly in a European level, as we need to take stride uh, for this to happen as other European countries make smaller and more calculated steps forward. On the electricity front, uh, the power demand is uh, set to rise in the next period because of the ample uh, large-scale electrification, the uptake of e-mobility, and the upcoming interconnections of our islands with the national grid. Uh, this makes imperative, imperative the need uh, to meet this uh, growing demand with green, affordable, clean energy, and at the same time upgrade our electricity networks, further promote smart grids, demand side management, and move forward with our cross-border interconnection. This is where hydrogen uh, could act as a Swiss army knife of our energy transition. And uh, since Adriatic and Ionian regions count more than 1,000 islands with few tens among them being uh, inhabited, I think that it is worth mentioning that hydrogen's module nature and uh, fuel cell technologies allow the implementation of hydrogen systems in uh, decentralized uh, applications, namely islands. Uh, in Greece, despite our uh, independent power transmission operator ambitious strategy to, to complete by 2030 the interconnection of uh, Crete, uh, Kiklades, uh, North and Eastern Aegean, and Dodeganis uh, with the national electricity grid, a limited number of smaller islands will probably remain disconnected from the main grid. Uh, for these cases, hydrogen technologies could be suitable to help islands generate uh, their own sustainable low-cost energy with the installation of renewable hybrid plants while serving as a fuel carrier for other energy uses. This is a field where EU SARE members could jointly work together and should be a part of the EU strategy for Adriatic and the Union region. Apart from power generation, I wanted to move forward to the decarbonization of the transportation sector. Uh, since the very beginning, uh, Prime Minister Mitsotakis' administration put electric mobility as a priority in our energy and transportation policy agenda. But uh, we need to recognize that the future will not solely rely on battery powered electric cars, but also hydrogen propulsion using fuel cells or so-called e-fuels. Hydrogen alone uh, or hydrogen based fuels like syngas, ammonia, methanol could be employed as e-fuels for cars and especially heavy duty trucks in the short to medium term, as well as ships and planes in the longer term. In addition, it is widely known that the uh, maritime sector is of strategic importance to Greece and hydrogen could become a game changer, uh, not only by using hydrogen and its carriers, such as ammonia and methanol uh, as a fuel, but mainly because of the need to connect uh, remote hydrogen production sites across the globe with the hydrogen markets by somehow emulating the, the LNG market. Our shipping industry is currently monitoring the latest technological developments with the aim to envision the new generation of ships, while for the moment we are focusing on uh, short distances ferries that would be ideal for the Aegean and the Ionian. And since we're in the maritime sector with all the new hydrogen technology that will be coming out in the next period, perhaps we should revisit the Adrian project and make hydrogen a protagonist in the green port transformation. This way we can ensure all the targets set of improving the port's overall efficiency, increase its uh, environmental performance, and ensure an emission-free port of operation, uh, they will all be met. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, hydrogen, as I said, is no longer an afterthought. Uh, our position is that a comprehensive European hydrogen policy is needed, and our countries might work together towards such direction. 
A common strategy would help the EU remove unnecessary barriers to accelerate the emergence of the hydrogen economy and avoid overregulation, for example. At the same time, this would enable us to get a better understanding of our internal market and better forecast the hydrogen imports uh, needed once the European demand and production capacity has, has been reliably estimated. In addition, large-scale investments in hydrogen can position the EU in the international hydrogen energy supply chain and also foster uh, new technological and industrial development uh, in the regional economies creating skilled jobs uh, that would be lost in the nothing to do scenario. Especially for Greece, it will not only help the regions affected the most by the decarbonization strategy, but also enable the repatriation of high caliber scientists who are currently working abroad. So the so-called brain drain could be reversed uh, into brain gain. Finally, uh, the role of public awareness and education should be emphasized. Technical knowledge about hydrogen and its technology will lead to greater acceptability through increased levels of confidence uh, in the constantly changing technology. We are certain that a, a European green hydrogen economy or low carbon hydrogen economy is possible and plausible. Uh, Greece aspires to take the stride forward and harvest this opportunity to find the sweet spot and better position itself in the hydrogen value chain. This cannot be done without using all the help we can get from our neighbors to co-create and co-share the generated added value for such endeavor. I truly look forward to seeing further future events on hydrogen uh, that will sparkle further cooperation between uh, our governments and the, our corporate sectors of EU share countries. European needs a stronger South uh, thank you, and I look forward to participating in the discussion. Thanks uh, also to you. Um, I like this uh, not brain uh, drain, but brain hydrogen welcome. <laughs> uh, and uh, it is true. I mean, this uh, new uh, uh, architecture of uh, energy sector, which will rely on renewables, will really change many flows, not only electricity flows, but also um, human flows. Uh, our, uh, we are already a little bit late, uh, some six minutes, but still manageable. Our next speaker is Marcello Capra, uh, a nuclear engineer, uh, who is uh, uh, more than this is important, that he is member of the Technical Secretariat for Energy of the Italian Ministry of Ecological Transition and since 2008, Italian delegate in the steering committee of the strategic energy technology plan, set plan uh, of the European Commission. So he is a perfect person to have a very deep uh, insight into uh, all scientific researches and technology developments uh, uh, on European level. Uh, among others, he's also appointed as national expert in the energy, climate and transport cluster of the New Horizon Europe program of the European Commission and member of various scientific committees and executive boards. So, but with this perfect insight into uh, European science, please, uh, Marcello Capra, the screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Janitz, for this kind of presentation. Good afternoon to everyone. Now I, I try to, to share my presentation. Okay, can you hear and see me? Uh, yes, uh, we, we cannot see you, but we can see your presentation. Yes, that, that is, that's important. <laughs> okay, thank you again for your kind invitation, in particular to my uh, dear friend and uh, director, Professor Gariba, who involved me in, in this very important uh, session of your forum and thank you for the opportunity to to give you a, a short uh, picture about the Italian uh, approach on smart grids and hydrogen and I'll try also to give you some issues for the, the, the possible cooperation of course. Uh, just to, to begin, just to give you an idea of the Italian energy situation, we have recently issued the 
the long-term strategy up to 2050. So you can see in the, in the right side, uh, the, the high, very high share of uh, variable uh, renewable energies uh, foreseen in the Italian energy mix, about uh, 450, 56, 560 terawatt hours up to 2050. So a very uh, a strong uh, uh, challenge. Um, we expect also a high electrical penetration in our, in our final use, uh, in particular for new types of electricity, electrical loads. We expect uh, as uh, power to gas, power to hydrogen, power to heat, and, and so on. We, so a, a very high share, in particular in the transport uh, sector and uh, also in the residential sector. So uh, in, in this uh, perspective, uh, of course, uh, uh, smart grids represent uh, an important option uh, for the future integrated energy system of our country. And uh, in this perspective, we have already foreseen in our national energy and climate plan, as you know, all the European countries had to, to send to, to the Commission two to years ago the, their energy and climate plans. Uh, and uh, in the left side, you, you can see the, the main issue about uh, smart grids and uh, energy integrated system. So system transformation with growing role of renewable energy sources and distributed generation, of course, modernization of electricity networks uh, in the perspective of uh, a, 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 a wide use of smart grids. And uh, of course, uh, the, the management and control of electricity network with these new challenges for the stability and security of the, of the network. On the right side, you, you can see that the strong uh, effort we have put uh, on smart grids in the very recent uh, recovery facility uh, plan of Italy. You, you, we, have, uh, we have foreseen a, a strong investment on smart grids, about uh, 3.6 billion euros for digitalization, flexibility of networks, uh, demand side uh, approach, and so on. Uh, we have also uh, an important investment on the resilience of the network uh, in front of climate change. We, we have uh, um, sometimes uh, uh, situation, a very critical situation of our networks. And so we have to increase the level of uh, resilience in, uh, in our energy system. Uh, in Italy, we, we have uh, uh, a number of smart grid projects uh, ongoing. Uh, you, you can see a very short picture. Um, the main project may be uh, is the, the so-called Puglia Active Network is a 170 million euros project uh, in charge of Enel, uh, our main uh, electric uh, DSO and the producer in Italy and uh, funded by the, the resources uh, put on the table by the so-called uh, NER300. It was a uh, a funding facility from the CO2 uh, options uh, revenues and uh, is involving all the Apulia region. The Apulia region is on the Adriatic Sea in the southern in Italy and it is a very, very impressive uh, smart grid project that we are uh, performing. Of course, we have also uh, many R&D activities funded but by a specific levy placed on the electricity tariffs, the so-called fund for the electricity system, and as Margaret's are one of the, the most important uh, uh, issues to, to be funded. Uh, let's move to hydrogen. Uh, 
the, the hydrogen. We have the Italian government uh, has uh, recently issued a, a preliminary set of guidelines uh, uh, of, of the Italian hydrogen strategy. We, we, we are working on the, the, the final strategy just in these uh, weeks and uh, the, the cooperation with SNAM is very strong. Our TSO is one of the most important players in Europe and in the world, and they are very involved in the hydrogen uh, sector. So the, the Italian government has defined uh, a few uh, points on the strategy, as you can see, to 2% of penetration of the region on final energy demand within 2030, up to 8 million tons of avoided CO2 emissions, and about 5 gigawatts of electrolyzers installed at within all, always uh, in 2030 for the, the, the capacity of, of hydrogen production. Uh, in order also to reduce uh, costs uh, and improve uh, performances of, uh, of this very important uh, component in the perspective of green hydrogen, of course. We have foreseen, but this is a very preliminary evaluation, up to 10 billion euros of investments, uh, excluded the, the renewables energy plants to be installed. You know that... Uh, we have to produce uh, hydrogen with additional uh, renewables uh, plants. And we cannot uh, count on the plants already foreseen in the national energy climate plan. So it's a, a, a huge investment we, we, we have to do in the next uh, years just to, to promote uh, green uh, uh, hydrogen. Uh, here uh, you you can see the the, um, uh, the 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 final picture uh, about uh, our investments uh, in the hydrogen sector inside the, the recovery and faci uh, resilience facility. Uh, we we had a, a specific hydrogen cluster uh, of three point six billion euros. You you can see. The, all the, the sectors of the value chain involved, uh, transport on wheels, uh, railway mobility, and in particular you can see a, a, a very important uh, investment in the heart of the industry, 2 billion euros, in particular in the refinery and uh, uh, and um, iron sectors where we have a very important uh, industrial organization in Italy. And uh, we, we already produced about 500,000 uh, tons of hydrogen only in the refinery sector. So th this is the, our uh, after we, we, we foreseen for the next five years is uh, the, the, the timing we have for the the recovery, of course. Uh, international cooperation is a very important uh, issue for the Italian energy strategy, of course, for a country as Italy, we, we have no uh, domestic uh, um, resources, energy resources, so we are very open to international cooperation in the Mediterranean Sea, but not only, of course. The two pillars of our uh, international cooperation are the, the European set plan and the, the partners in mission innovation. The, the set plan, as you probably know, is the, the European framework for uh, R&D in the energy technology sector. And all the European uh, countries have joined uh, this, uh, this plan. Of course, it's not a fund, but uh, it is based on a, a number of uh, tools, in particular the, the first one, the most important, the, the Horizon Europe, which has been recently launched by the Commission with uh, uh, many resources for financing R&D activities. 
Uh, the second pillar is miso innovation. Is, I, I suppose you, you know this. It's an, you know it uh, is an international partner. It's joined at, at this time by 25 nations all over the world, and uh, plus the European Commission. The final goal for the country is to double the double the, the, the public expenditure on R&D uh, for clean energy technologies. Italy in particular is committed to double its uh, R&D public expenditure baseline of about 220 million euros up to uh, 450 million. So a very uh, challenging uh, effort for, uh, for us. Uh, Mr. Capra, uh, excuse me to interrupt you. I know you have four slides more, but uh, we are really running out of time. Can you please do it in, in a minute or two? <laughs> yes, Sorry. okay. I jump. Uh, <laughs> you can see, I, I leave you the presentation, of course, the, the, the project uh, launched in the European Commission on Smart Grids. These are also two flagship uh, initiatives on smart grids on European levels. You, you can see for the an optimized European power grid and the second one for an integrated local and regional energy system. And uh, on the right side, you can see the main actions uh, foreseen. Uh, just to, to conclude my presentation on Mission Innovation, Mission Innovation has launched eight innovation challenges, which are global calls on action aimed to accelerating the, the research and development activities in technology areas that can uh, benefit, provide significant benefits on CO2 reduction. Italy has decided to be involved in all the eight uh, challenges. In particular, you can see the first one on smart grids and the last one on hydrogen. On, this, on smart grids, we are colleagues together in India and China. And also on hydrogen, we are very uh, involved, in particular in this hydrogen valley approach. Uh, this is the last slide of course uh, we are also involved uh, the, the Greek uh, colleague uh, as uh, as uh, cited the, the IPCI of course we are very involved in the uh, hydrogen IPCI we are building in in, in these uh, months and together other European countries. We are also active partner in the joint undertaking on research on hydrogen. So we are very open to international cooperation also in the Adriatic and Ionian area. And of course, we are, we are ready to, to give you all the, the, the information and the, the cooperation needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Capra. Uh, this was really impressive. I mean, uh, the, what Italy in this recovery plan is planning to do uh, will become a, a hydrogen hub, <laughs> definitely. Uh, but uh, now we will jump to next speaker, and I will really ask next three speakers to shorten their presentation a little bit, if possible. Uh, Gianluca Marini uh, is, uh, we, we already got some questions from the audience, so there should be some time for debate. Uh, Gianluca Marini is Executive Vice President Consulting Division at CESI, uh, it's a, a consultancy company, world leading technical consulting and engineering company in the field of technology and innovation. Uh, he holds a um, master's degree in electrical engineering from University of Trieste, and MBA from Bocconi School of Management in uh, Milan. Uh, he's also chairman of Enernex, a US-based company, and serves as board member of various associations and foundations. Uh, Gianluca, screen is yours. Uh, sorry, you are a victim of uh, <laughs> previous speakers. Uh, but make it a little bit shorter. <laughs> it's I, I in advance. <laughs> I will. Uh, thank you, Janetz. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to uh, all the distinguished uh, speakers uh, 
and participants uh, in this uh, sixth uh, EU ZER forum. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today and share with you basically our view on the smart grids and hydrogen spaces, which are really, really uh, interesting. Let me share my screen. All right. For those of you who don't know, basically, Chasey, in a nutshell, we are a, a global engineering testing and power system consulting company uh, operating globally through our 12 uh, uh, locations worldwide, from the South America to the uh, Far East. And we serve uh, more than 2,000 clients in over 70 countries. And particularly interesting, this forum, even because Chesi has been quite active in the Balkans over the last uh, uh, five to 10 years. And we are really close to this uh, uh, development and this evolution. But let's jump directly into the smart grids and hydrogen uh, topics, uh, who we believe are two of the many pillars that drive the roadmap towards a full decarbonization of the economy and the human activities uh, at the European level, but I would enlarge it uh, for sure to neighboring country. It has been a long journey that started in 2009 with the first climate and energy package that uh, you all know. Uh, and through years, uh, we have seen uh, many other directives, uh, packages and regulations uh, that uh, led to the actual targets that are in force in the Green Deal. As you can see, the 55% uh, greenhouse gases reduction, uh, as well as a 40% uh, of uh, uh, share for renewable energies, as well as an important 36% uh, of the energy saving. Uh, of course, uh, not all the countries uh, uh, of the EU ZER uh, belong to European uh, Union. However, most of them, if not all of them, are really much committed to this kind of process towards decarbonization. If we take a close look at the situation in the EU ZER uh, space, besides the case of Albania, where 100% basically uh, is energy produced by one single source, which is hydro. The rest of the countries uh, demonstrate that there is a good uh, potential for exploiting renewable energies as well as hydrogen in order to shift between a situation where fossil fuels are still a significant share of the production into a more balanced energy mix uh, uh, looking ahead. But if we look just at the production, we miss an important piece in the puzzle, which is the infrastructure below. Uh, on the left, uh, I just reported uh, what is actually the electricity infrastructure linking uh, Italy to Montenegro and Italy uh, to Greece, and Constantinos was mentioned this before. Uh, there are some projects to reinforce and to double the capacity of these uh, uh, power links. On the right side, you see the interconnections for the gas pipelines, uh, as well as uh, uh, for the corridors. I mean, this is an important point. It's not only a matter of linking countries uh, if you don't uh, work on reinforcing also internal corridors that will unlock the full potential of the, of the links. And especially in the Western Balkans, there are some areas that I highlighted where uh, some actions, uh, in our opinion, are very much uh, needed. As you know, there since 2013, there is a framework that uh, aims at planning infrastructure in, in, this, in this field. However, the very interesting um, proposition that has been uh, made to EU involves uh, the so-called project of mutual interest, uh, uh, not to replace the common ones, but it's just because they will involve EU member states and third country states uh, in order to take uh, forward uh, common projects. And there will be a special uh, uh, permitting path uh, within the Connecting Europe facility, which will be very much appreciated. If you look at the Italian case, uh, Marcello was showing already a few figures of this. 
uh, we, we started a few a few years ago. I mean, in terms of targets 2030, we are well ahead of what are the average at European level, aiming at 70% of share of renewable on the consumption, as well as 40% in terms of energy efficiency, which is quite a lot. Uh, and the hydrogen space, uh, uh, as you can see, the five gigawatt of electrolyzers will translate into something like uh, uh, 35 terawatt hours a year of generation from renewable energies to be added to the system. So it's a huge quantity that we expect uh, to enter the system in the coming in the coming years. When it comes to hydrogen, I mean, we know that hydrogen is, a, is an important topic, but the way we will translate it into practice will make uh, a whole difference. And there are many models that aim to do so. Uh, we just reported the three, uh, probably most easiest one to, to, be, to be understood, which is a full de decentralized model where electrolyzers will, will uh, link together with the renewable energies at consumption centers, so where the energy will be needed. There will be a transport of electricity where the electrolyzer will be at consumption center whilst the, the renewable energies will be probably produced in uh, large parks uh, where the source uh, will be better, uh, as well as there will be a model where the hydrogen will be transported, as Cosmo was showing before. This will be part of the SNAM and the other transmission operators within the gas field. Well, what is better? What is, is the least better? So our opinion is that, as usual, there will be a mix of the three depending on the countries, depending on the situations. And the key here is not to make one win over the others, but it's to find a way to make them work together and efficiently. Uh, to conclude, um, speaking about smart grids and hydrogen is probably two of the topics which uh, uh, are part of a larger picture, which is the three, we believe, main, main important uh, uh, puzzles that we have to put together between the carbonization, electrification, and new customer needs. I mean, every one of us will have to change their habits in consumption, and the forcing habilitator for that will be a massive digitalization process, which will take part in all of the three areas that I was mentioning before. This will imply that uh, joint complementarity role of power and green gases, notably hydrogen, will be to be expected in the future. Uh, let's pay attention to this uh, project of mutual interest. There will be uh, more and more a nice instrument to make uh, all of these infrastructure projects, project uh, a reality. Uh, also, this has been mentioned, and I would like to highlight it because we believe that it will be also key, uh, and harmonization of the regulatory framework between EU and the third-party countries will be key to uh, make everything possible. And also, I mean, uh, I didn't have time today to go through all the experience we have in this field, but I will invite you to see our website at chasey.it for whatever doubt or clarification you might want. I'll stop here. Time is really limited. So, Janet, back to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Gianluca. Uh, and uh, with this, I would jump to the next speaker and really ask next two speakers, last two, to limit their presentation to five minutes, if possible. Uh, Nebuj Shavucinic, his uh, Head of Development Center uh, of Serbian Transmission System Operator, Electricity One, Elektromreža Serbije, uh, being there from 2008. Uh, he's, he started as dispatcher. We all know how important or core job of transmission system operator this is. Um, responsible for making national plan for development of Serbian transmission system. Uh, together with investment plan, uh, his, uh, uh, he holds positions in ENSOE association, so European uh, family of transmission system operators, uh, and so on and so on. Since I don't have much time, Nebojša, uh, uh, of course, uh, also uh, academic career, uh, a very nice one, uh, University of Niš, uh, uh, engineer, uh, 
Neboisha, the floor is yours. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, this introduction. So just to share my presentation. So can you now see my presentation? Yes, yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Excellent. So uh, I will speak from the corner uh, of someone who comes from electricity industry in this panel. So so on the first slide i try to summarize how can sm smart grids enable renewables in electric in industry so uh, the most important issue is variability so the smart grid concept of demand side management can directly enable uh, renewables uh, by allowing electricity demand to be controllable so if the output of pv power plants drops due to clouds uh, demand side management program can trigger reductions in electricity uh, demand and on that way avoiding the need for uh, dispatching power plants, reducing the need for spinning reserve and maintaining power quality. The second most important issue is integration of distribution generation and we expect that smart grid can uh, provide system operators um, uh, with continual real-time information uh, on uh, how uh, these systems are operating and allow full control over these systems. So the next one is improve consumer information and uh, control. So uh, smart meters allow for two-way communication between utility and the consumer. So this can encourage renewables, for example, providing the consumers with information that allows them to use electricity only when it's uh, available from renewables and by consequence electricity price drops. Uh, the next one is improved transmission and distribution system monitoring and control, which is very important. So smart grid technologies can allow obtaining fine-grained information from transmission and distribution systems. So such information could be used to improve reliability and re reduce costs. This in turn can help renewables by uh, matching the output of distributed generation to the transmission and uh, uh distribution system needs and the last one is integration of the new new resources so uh, smart grids technologies can allow us for optimal use of alternative technologies on aggregated weight all distributed resources like distribution generation demand side management and different kind of the distributed storage like electric vehicles batteries etc and uh, on that way we can avoid the need for new uh, large power plants so uh, let's say the next slide so uh, regarding the i would say generally speaking power to gas technology but uh, there are two uh, two main ways of integration uh, wind and uh, photovoltaic into uh, electric systems. So first one is integration of using power grid and uh, because the local production usually differs from the local uh, consumption, the energy has to be brought into the load centers. So uh, it's uh, possible to obtain higher utilization of the renewables by uh, transporting the power to the area with the needs for electricity. So this may require from us to develop uh, new infrastructure projects and reinforcement of the power grid, existing power grid. So, and uh, the second uh, very attractive uh, way of the integration is uh, integration using conversions what we talk. So for instance, convert power to gas and back ben, uh, then back again from gas to power. So it may be valuable approach to balance the system as the energy needed to balance the system is on a far lower scale than the energy uh, needed for base load. Uh, but also next to that uh, solution based on electrolysis uh, uh, can be used directly as seasonal gas storage system. Uh, so, and uh, some studies show that uh, high level of renewable penetration towards CO2 neutral electric system can only be achieved with power to gas system. So, uh, Mr. Vucinic, uh, uh, yes. excuse me, really to intervene. I know you have 10 slides, now you are with the third yes. one. Can you, uh, can you finish in next uh, one, two minutes, please? 
uh maybe maybe i can just speed up my presentation and just focus on some maybe numbers uh so uh recently hence we published the ndp uh 2020 and on that uh the uh, we involved a scenario called distributed energy uh, and that scenario is full energy scenario compliant with target of uh, the Paris Agreement uh, and the presence the decentralized approach to the energy transition. So on this ground, consumers actively participate in society uh, driven by small scale decentralized solutions and circular approach. So on this uh, slide, you, you, you can see, for example, numbers uh, for the social economic welfare in million euros per year for all projects present in TVNDP 2020 and uh, for all projects uh, of the Southeast Europe present in that uh, TVNDP. And we can see that in that scenario, uh, the value of the social economic welfare is on highest level comparing with the rest of the scenarios. Also, uh, analysis uh, shows that uh, uh, we have much higher MPV values for all uh, CSC uh, projects in our region in that scenario when we compare them with the rest of the scenarios. Also on this uh, graphic, you can see, let's say, some uh, uh, dependencies uh, on the eastern uh, Balkan border. That border divides uh, Balkans on two, uh, uh, two, two areas. So, uh, one is uh, Romania, Bulgaria, and Greece, and uh, another area is uh, West Balkans. So you can see in that scenario in distribution uh, energy that if we increase uh, increase uh, transmission capacity, uh, that we will achieve the highest level of the benefits in that scenarios. So the next one is, okay, uh, on this slide you can see let's say on illustrative way, the, the benefits per each of them, that scena uh, scenario. So um, for all projects in TVNDP and for only projects in our region. So uh, also on this slide, uh, you can see on illustrative way, total installed, installed generation uh, in our region, but separated on EU countries and non-EU countries. So. Uh, on that slide, you can see uh, significant differences in the generation mix of that two area of our region. So the, uh, you can see that currently we have st uh, st uh, state that in West Balkans, we don't have uh, actually uh, solar power plants, but we expect to have it, uh, let's say, um, in 2030, uh, only 7% uh, till 2040 for 12%, uh, which is really, really small amount of the solar power plants. Uh, but uh, on contrary, uh, on EU countries in our region, we can see, let's say, uh, in 2040, 26% of the solar. So. Uh, yeah, uh, but it's developing in the Western Balkans as well. Uh, I yeah. think coal is out, everybody realized this, and uh, renewables are in, and Serbia is, uh, uh, with new law, will be a leader, I believe, in this development, and I'm happy about that. Uh, sorry, Mr. Vucinic, now <laughs> I will yeah. pass the, the microphone to Milan Zdravkovic, uh, he's uh, a mechanical engineer, uh, head of uh, um, Serbian, uh, uh, so uh, the distribution system operators uh, branch uh, in, in the Serbian uh, uh, gas incumbent and uh, he's responsible for uh, uh, grids, uh, or distribution grids and of course uh, which will once host also hydrogen. Uh, Milan Zraukovic, sorry for short introduction, uh, uncomparable to the others, I'm really running and uh, I know you have only one slide and I'm happy about that. And, uh, excuse me in advance because at uh, 2.26 I will take the floor again. <laughs> the floor is now yours, sorry. <laughs> Mr. 
Do, do we have Mila Zdravković with us? Uh, Sorry, my mistake. So thank you, Johannes. Uh, I understand the situation. So after all, I believe that you need to organize this meeting in Isola, probably in the restaurant Parangal, which I like the most and prefer in Isola to, to continue to this discussion. So anyway, um, thank you for the organizer for inviting me because uh, one of the major conclusion and uh, prompt uh, conclusion of this discussion we had is that this, I believe, brings completely new frontiers for speaking about, from the perspective of the region, of the Western Balkans, of the energy sector. And yes, we need to discuss and to, uh, I believe, even more to be educated about this in the future. So that's one of the maybe uh, ideas that I can uh, propose to Energy Community Secretariat that we maybe can use the opportunity and to jointly approach to this matter as my previous speakers and colleagues mentioned it already. The major con uh, conclusion of the, of the situation that we have, uh, if we are speaking about uh, the potential of using hydrogen in the future is that we need the infrastructure. Uh, Mr. Gianluca mentioned on his uh, uh, presentation on one slide that uh, uh, the comparability between the situation of the existing infrastructure uh, between West and uh, Southeast Europe, uh, especially in the Western Balkans, is uh, pretty much differ. And that means that uh, for using the potential of the hydrogen in the future, we need to stimulate the further implementation of the uh, missing infrastructure and must emphasize, at least from the perspective of the distribution system operator, that we are not only speaking about the uh, cross-border pipelines but and reinforcement of the high-pressure lines, but also to uh, stimulate the, uh, the construction of the missing uh, low-pressure grids, which will, in the future, bring the potential to use the hydrogen on a desirable level. So this is the way uh, I believe it would be the, um, some kind of the roadmap that needs to be um, supported in the region, uh, because after all, we, as Jan has mentioned it, the call is becoming history and actually, uh, the, my personal belief is that the ecology requirements in today and the, in the middle uh, future that is coming in front of us will definitely drive and uh, uh, structure the, the future steps in the energy sector. So this is my conclusion. I don't want to take you more time and I believe that we can discuss later. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Milan Zdravković, uh, uh, a lot. Uh, in the meantime, we received some uh, questions in the uh, chat uh, box. Uh, I will be very brief. Uh, Janes Topolšek, what kind of, uh, uh, how is ammonium methadone produced and used? This is related to hydrogen. Uh, and uh, what kind of water allows electrolysis? And the second question, Goran Nikolovsky, when will the new regulation for hydrogen be prepared? On this one, perhaps I can ask, answer, the uh, European Commission is preparing uh, amendments to gas directive and gas regulation, and they announced they will publish them in the fourth quarter of this year. So it means most probably they will be adopted by the end of 2022. Um, uh, on the, the one uh, question from Janis Topolšek, perhaps uh, if I can... Uh, 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 find the victim, Kozma Panzaki, perhaps? Hydrogen expert? Yes, or, uh, yeah. sorry, uh, here I am. Uh, in terms of the usage of, uh, of water, this is clearly an important element there uh, in terms of uh, especially areas that are typically water poor. But recent technologies allow for the usage of, let me say, uh, recycled water from waste mm, waste treatment facilities. So that's an issue that, for example, also in areas such as North, North Africa, uh, we are dealing with, with a number of uh, technological providers. In terms of uh, ammonia versus hydrogen, uh, clearly ammonia, green ammonia, especially in large scale projects such as NEOM has been touted as the uh, cheap solution to export uh, large scale and large quantities of, uh, of hydrogen. Uh, the issue is uh, how, and of, and of course it is cheaper as of today to 
export by vessel green ammonia. The, the final issue would be then how could you use this green ammonia in final applications, right? Because then if you want to get green hydrogen out of green ammonia, then you have to, of course, have a, a cracking process at the end. Uh, or you need to have, for example, in the mobility space, fuel cells which natively will use green ammonia. So I would say I think that uh, in terms of international trade of uh, uh, intercontinental trade of uh, green hydrogen versus green ammonia, the jury is still out and there are commercial competitions going on right now between uh, producers and suppliers. Okay, thank you. Uh, now organizers are urging me to conclude. Uh, I uh, prepared a short uh, conclusion which hopefully encompasses all the discussion. Uh, it's, uh, it sounds like, uh, given the difficult context and the challenges ahead, a clear consensus emerged on the need of enhancing energy cooperation within the EU CER and beyond. Its borders to accelerate energy recovery and transition towards a green economy. Smart grids and hydrogen represent two key assets and directions while moving towards a zero carbon energy system. A green energy deal for the Adriatic and Ionian region would provide EUSR member states with opportunities for collaboration on smart power grids and hydrogen to share technology innovation, business potential and coverage on a common mission. I hope this uh, uh, summarizes the presentations which you had. I would, because they will switch us off in uh, uh, practically second, I would just like to thank all the speakers, panelists, and of course all, to all the audience who was with us. Thank you and hope to see you soon in person in Isola. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.